Can you take, take the roll call, call please? Brian Boyle. Kim Farah. Here. Stephen Finnegan. Here. Amy Gentile. Here. Barbara Kishka. Here. Katie Kingston. Here. Sheila Lowe's. Sean O'Neill. Preston Savage. Thank you. I'll, I'll rise for the pledge. pledge. Moving on to the approval of the minutes from the 1021 meeting, is there a motion to approve? A motion to approve. Second. Everybody makes a motion. Is there a second? Second. Steve seconds. All in favor? Five zero. Moving on to delegates and individuals. Before I start, I would like to read a statement. First, these meetings are specifically for the board to conduct its business. As a board, we've got duties and responsibilities that we have to address for the district to continue and operate. While our board meetings are open to the public, except non-meetings and non-public meetings, our board meetings are not public hearings where the public has the right to speak out. In other words, board meetings are not public meetings, but meetings held in public. Second, while well, the board welcomes participation of all interested citizens, all attendees are expected to conduct themselves in a civil and respectful manner, and the board will not tolerate interruptions, harassment, discrimination, threats, or other conduct that interferes, interferes with these meetings. There is an appropriate time and a specific manner for citizens to be heard at board meetings. This is during the delegate session. Board policy BEDH governs the process for citizens' participation in meetings. Third, because some members of the public in attendance of our meeting have not followed the rules of order, I do want to put everybody on notice that the board intends to strictly comply with policy BEDH. It requires that all citizens do the same while attending our board meeting. Interruptions, name calling, booing, and speaking, making intimidating and bigoted remarks during the meeting will result in removal from the meeting. Violations of policy BEDH shall also result in immediate removal from the meeting. Thus, please only speak during your allotted time, limit yourself to three minutes, and refrain from speaking about employees or students, and conduct yourselves in a civil manner. Failure to abide by these rules of order will, at a result, at a minimum, result in your loss of speaking privileges. If, after losing your speaking privileges or receiving a warning, you can, your conduct continues to interfere with the meeting, or otherwise violates the rules of order, law enforcement will be asked to physically remove you from the meeting. As you may be aware, once detained by law enforcement, you may be subject to criminal charges. Moving on to the delegate session, the first person is Osvaldo Hernandez. Time started? Excuse me? Is my time started? It's starting right now. Okay. Well, I'd, I'd like to speak on to, I know you, I'm not supposed to speak about the children, I'm speaking about my children that go to the school under your supervision. So, um, when are the masks going to come off? One. Two, when are you going to stop subjugating my child, my children, their children, and everybody else's children in the school and start educating them. Start doing your job. That is supposed to be your job. We, you, guys have, you guys have created a, a, a whole generation of kids that are fearful of their own shadows, fearful of police. When me and my wife, we try to teach our children to turn to police when they need help, turn to firemen when they need help. You are teaching them to be afraid of authority. There's no reason for this. The facts state it all. I have a book here, written by Alex Brenson. And in this book, Your Own Science, Your CDC, on March 24th, the Center for Disease Control can issue new guidelines for reporting coronavirus deaths, saying explicitly that the rules for coding, selection of underlying causes of death are expected, expected, 
to result in COVID being underlying. Notably, the CDC did not require a positive coronavirus test for physicians, coroners, or health department to find the virus had caused the death. You guys are playing a game with my children. And not only that, you're putting them through mental anguish. You're segregating them from their own friends. What, where, where is this that kids are supposed to have a natural immunity when, when they interact with other children? Why are they not allowed to interact with other children? What, what is the cause of these masks? You're trying, you say that you're protecting children right now. What you're doing is you're causing them more harm than good. You're causing them mental anguish. Kids are, kids are being like, they're committing suicide across the country because they're being, they're being separated from their own friends. They're not allowed to interact with other children. When we, even you, growing up, you were allowed to interact with other children. That's how most of us all got our natural immunity from just various little bugs. Social interaction. We are inhuman in our nature. Social interaction is in us. For you to separate us and put us in a, in a corner like we're a bad dog, we're vermin, like trying to stick us up there, like we're what? Are you guys the new Nazi party and we are the new Jews? What is going on? You guys talk about unifying us and creating a country together. When you guys make a pledge to this flag, under God, we are not divided. We are supposed to be unified. What you guys are doing, you're creating lines and you're dividing all of us. You're creating this boiling point to a lot of us that it's just, it's, 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 it's beyond maddening. And I'm here to say that I'm going to start to rally people because I want to vote you guys all off that bench. I want, I want you all off. Thank, Thank you, sir. Go ahead. David, David Kylie Atkinson. Thank you. I'm just, just going to read a little bit from um, our Constitution, our New Hampshire Constitution, which, you know, like you, I took an oath to, and I swore my allegiance to the state. You know, I'm a New Hampshire citizen. Um, all power residing originally in and being derived from the people, all the magistrates and officers of government, are their substitutes and agents, and at all times accountable to them. Government, therefore, should remain open, accessible, accountable, and responsive. To that end, the public's right of access to government proceedings and records shall not be unreasonably restricted. You guys need to know this. You need to know it. And I don't, and I don't, I don't think, maybe you do, but I don't think you really care. Um, I served an affidavit before the meeting started. I provided nine copies so all members can have it. And it's an affidavit, it's, it's public notice and demand for resignation of the school board members of the Timberland Regional School District. Okay? I'm giving notice of trespass on my constitutional rights. They're protected by the Constitution as a New Hampshire citizen. You have, you're exercising undelegated powers in its criminal and its fraud. And you need to read it, really understand what you're doing. This is hard for me. I know you work hard. I know you care for the kids. Ozzy said some incredibly enlightening things, and, and it's, it is true. We're not together. I don't think you guys are doing the right thing. We've had four hospitalizations, pediatric hospitalizations since August 12th, out of nine, almost 9,000 student cases, yet you continue to do this. You're ignoring the data. You run three-week evaluation periods with no criteria, no baseline. You know this is not hurting kids, okay? If you want to be vaccinated, you can if you're worried about catching it. This is not fair. I have no obligation to comply with legal access. I'm sorry, I don't. I don't care what you think about what your rules say. You can't have a rule that's repugnant to the Constitution. You also can't act like a legislature and think your rules have, your rules have the weight of law. They don't. We're not a home rule state. We're a Dillon's Law state. You have to get your powers from, the, from the, our assembled and elected, duly elected legislature. They're the ones who set law. They have not done so with respect to masks. You guys need to read. You need to educate. You need to learn. You need to start respecting the people. We are the people. We're the ones. We're the ones that create government. You don't rule us, we're not your subjects. And you've been behaving that way for a long time. And I'm tired of being treated like a second class citizen when I come here. And being asked to sit in a special place, I'm tired of it. You have no right to do that. I mean, I don't appreciate being called disabled, called out as disabled. When in that first meeting, Chairman Farah, I don't appreciate that. I don't like it. 
and it makes me feel like you believe we're subjects, and you're pissing people off heavily. That's all I have to say, guys. Start, start behaving like elected officials. Understand your constitution. Thank you. Stephanie Dubiano. I want to just read something that I saw somebody post online. Uh, doctor, it was probably about a week or so ago. This is from Aaron Curiarty, medical doctor. This is, this is all he said. What is it like for a kid to go through an entire day at school and not see a single person smile at him? In a scientific, technocratic society, because this harm cannot easily be medically quantified, we dismiss it. Real harms to the human spirit apparently don't count. What you're doing to these kids in the interest of safety is harming them in so many ways, and we won't know for years. And it's completely unfair, and you don't have the authority to do it. And on top of that, when these parents come, these parents, these parents that have come week after week after week, month after month after month, they need relief for their children. And what they get, they get dismissiveness. They get talked down to. They get, they get attitude. They get called domestic terrorists. It's outrageous. These parents only want the best for their children. And you, every single one of you up there, Superintendent, assistant superintendent, every single one of you up there is impeding their ability to protect their children to the best of their ability in the interest of safety. And the science doesn't back you up. It's shameful. It is shameful that we are still here. And I want to tell you, from the meeting back in the end of August, I think it was the end of August, beginning of September, when you said you were going to revisit these statistics, Parents have been waiting, and you have said nothing to them. Nothing to them. It is shameful. And I'm telling you, you're going to see more and more parents come. More and more parents are going to sit here. More and more parents are going to come up. We're not going to go away. These parents are not going to go away because you don't have that right, and you are injuring the children. Get it together. Seriously, get it together. Laura Roy Plasso. Um, I'm here because I wanted to ask for clarification regarding the indoor mask decision matrix that was adopted by our district on August 19th. It seems that as of now, and really starting about mid-October, that masks should be optional in some of our schools, according to that matrix. It appears that the matrix is either not being used correctly not being used at all, or there's been a lack of communication to parents regarding switching to mask optional at this point for some schools. The way the matrix should work, as far as any of us understand it, is that it includes two variables that are used together, cases in facility or school and level of community transmission. When one row from the cases in facility and one column from the level of community transmission intersect, then a mask recommendation is made. Cases in facility options include sporadic cases, clusters, and outbreaks. But when cases in the facility or the school is zero, then the matrix should not even be activated for those schools, as there is no option on the matrix for what to do when there are zero cases. And it's assumed that masks are optional at that point for those schools. And around half of our schools have had zero cases since the October 22nd Timberlane Weekly COVID report. So this would indicate that the matrix is not being used correctly. However, if you are only going by level of community transmission, which is what seems to be the case, then the matrix is irrelevant and not being used at all because masks are still being required since the county level is still substantial, irregardless of the fact that some of our facilities have zero cases. It can't be both ways, and correct me if I'm wrong, Otherwise, please clarify why masks have not been communicated as being optional right now in some schools based on the matrix that you adopted. 
And in fact, when do masks become optional? It was never discussed. And at the August 19th meeting, there was a motion that was passed that stated that you would review the numbers on September 16th for our district and neighboring districts that didn't have masks. Well, now it's been two months and there's been a drastic drop in cases in our district, but there's been no discussion on how our district and neighboring districts are faring or how you're justifying that masks are still needed all the time in all schools with numbers at or close to zero, especially when now that vaccines are most available for most kids. These kids need a break from the exhausting practice of mask wearing. Their physical health is not in danger sitting in a classroom maskless. But by continuing to force the masks, their mental health continues to decline. Please take this into consideration while COVID is virtually non-existent in our district. Thank you. No one Pelletier, Plesto. Different week, same speech. Um, I'm here once again. I'm advocating for my kid, and I'm going to come here every week until she can breathe normally. I mean, I know the heat's back on the school because she comes back every day complaining. And uh, it's really sad that I have to come up here every week and fight for my choice as a parent. And it's really upsetting that you guys don't even seem to, doesn't phase you at all. When your kids aren't coming home to you and complaining, and you're powerless, and I come here to speak to you every week and nothing gets done. And not only does nothing get done, we're treated like cattle. And it makes me ashamed to be part of this town. And I really think you guys need to do a better job. Thank you. Jessica Pelletier, Plasto. Hello. Um, I wanted to speak tonight because I felt the need to share my frustration uh, and building on what some of the parents have already said. Uh, we're here at every meeting. We've been at every meeting for months. Um, you see our names on the papers. You see our faces when we're here, but I don't think you're hearing our voices. It doesn't feel like you're hearing our voices. Um, we express our concerns. We want masks optional for our children. We want that choice for ourselves. And um, it just feels like our concerns just aren't heard. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's no COVID, on, uh, COVID updates on the agendas for several weeks, yet we keep coming and talking and asking. And it just, you know, it, we don't, it doesn't get addressed. And it's very, very frustrating. Um, you know, we, we would like to hear some feedback. And we just aren't getting it. And we're just going to keep coming to every meeting, and we're just going to continue to share our concerns, and we hope that you will start listening to us. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on, I'm going to um, <clears throat> change the agenda. In the first item on the agenda, I'm going to hold off on the SAU 106 logo and letterhead design until those students can get here. They're not here, are they? Yeah. So the first, 745, okay, so we'll wait. Um, so the next item on the agenda is to accept a donation from the Hannaford Helps Schools Program donation. Um, this is a check for $522 from Hannaford Helps, so I'm looking for a motion to accept that from Hannaford. I uh, motion that we accept the $500 dollars from Hannaford Helps with gratitude. Is there a second? Katie seconds. All in favor? Thank you. I think this is an annual sort of uh, donation and we appreciate that as a district. The next item on the agenda is the audit findings update. Um, at the last meeting, we reviewed the management letter and uh, approved of the audit. This is the corrective action that um, our CFO, Maria, has uh, taken to ensure that we do not receive those findings again. One of this is mainly due to the gift cards, yes. Is it possible to get these documents put on the screen so that people can follow along? I don't know if we have that capability tonight. Can we, can we show these on the screen? The agenda packet? 
Do you have that available? Or if not, Barbara, what? Somebody, somebody's up here. Yay. Yes, there you go. So um, you can scroll down. Keep going, keep going. Go past the minutes. It's, it's about probably eight pages in. If you don't look at the agenda. Okay, well, if we can get that. So... <clears throat> And, and for the public, these agenda packets are posted after the meeting. So are there any questions on this executive summary regarding changes to the audit or to the procedures to uh, get rid of any weaknesses that were noticed on the audit? No questions? I, I just wanted to thank Mrs. Watkins, Mrs. Watkins for um, taking action on all the items from the 2020 audit. And it looks like we're going to be in good shape for the 2021. I agree. Thank you. Moving on, then, uh, there, we have a request for a transfer of funds um, from the special ed account for private tuition, which is 112,564,617.3, to account 112,130,369.33.4 in the amount of $200,000. The reason for this is the funds that were allocated for students for out of district placement. These students have been brought back in district, and we need the contracted services to help support them. So that is actually a good thing. We do try to keep our students in district if possible. So I'm looking for a motion to accept this budget transfer request dated November 9th from the CFO. So moved. Barbara makes a motion. Is there a second? Katie seconds. All in favor? 5-0. Yep. Uh, just before we go, can, can I, I don't know if it's appropriate, but can I make a comment to the public about the mask piece, if it's appropriate? You know, I, I just, people are leaving, and I, I'd, I'd like to get sort of something off my chest, if possible. I, I, I guess I'll allow it then. Thank you. So uh, I first want to just, and, and, and forgive me for this, I, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, first and foremost, um, I, I continue to hear everything you guys are saying every week. I know it does not feel like we are hearing you. We are. I am. I'll speak for myself. I hear what you're saying. Um, it is really, really challenging each and every week to try to have a, a dialogue um, it, especially in this forum. And, you know, when, when I look at the policies that have been created by, by this board and adopted, we are looking at the safety of every child in this district. I get that nobody wants to wear masks. We don't want to wear masks. But we have a responsibility to protect all of the kids in this district. This is not, a, and I don't want to get into the discussion about this, we have a philosophical difference whether COVID is a thing. I get it. I get it. And if you want to rally people to vote me out in two years, that's your choice. But ultimately, our job, my job, is to look at the members of my community. And, and I, I, you guys, you're right, you're here. You're the loudest. You guys are here, and I appreciate that. But what, is, what you don't see are the many, many, many other people that we're talking to who feel differently. And there's, there's, we are very divided. There are two separate philosophies on this issue. And I get it. But our job is to find a way to protect all of our kids. We care about your kids or else we wouldn't be here. We sacrifice a lot of time, energy, effort to be here. And I know that may not mean anything to you guys, and that's fine. It means something to us, and we care. Each and every one of us do. And so to consistently hear 
about us being the Nazi party or, you know, us not being, you know, caring about your kids. It's, it's hard to hear every single week. Yep. So, again, this isn't a conversation. This is just a statement. So, nope, not talking down. This is just what the policy is. So, so, so uh, all right, um, sorry, I, I, yeah, I'm all done. That was, that was just my point, is that we do care. We do care. Great, thank, thank you. you. Moving on, thank you. Moving on to the distant learning, distance learning plans for inclement weather days. This is an informational action item. Sir, could you please? Okay. Well, let's move on and, and go back to the item on the agenda for the SAU 106 logo and letterhead design. Student recognition, I'm going to turn this over to Chris Kellen. No? Okay. <laughs> then it's all my honor. Um, oh, Josh, are you here? I think I'm going to have to move. Yes. There's Josh Friel. Josh Friel is joining us via Zoom. In Kendall Morrow, I'm going to ask Kendall to come on up. I guess we'll find this little corner on the stage. And I'm going to probably put the two of you on the spot. Come on around. Um, hi, how are you? I am great, thank you. Um, Josh and Kendall, maybe you can tell us a little bit more because I don't know all the specifics about how it was that you uh, together or separately together, I think, created um, the SAU 106 logo in letterhead for us. Um, so we basically just walked into marketing class, first period, and we were told that it was a contest. So. Us being super competitive, we we really focused on it, and um, it was kind of like a class competition, basically to see whose logo could be the best. Um, Josh and I ended up working together towards the end to kind of collaborate our ideas, and worked out. Josh, anything you'd like to add? Um, that was pretty much it, you know, it was, it was a cool project. Um, we incorporated a lot of, like, each other's designs and kind of came up with what would work best for everybody. Great. So, um, we do have a couple of things for all of you. First and foremost, we'd like to thank you very much for really giving a professional look to our new SAU with our new um, SAU logo. And, well, first I'll start with, and Josh, you're going to get one of these, one of each of these as well. Um, here we have, I don't know if you can zoom in on that, but this is the letterhead that has the logo on it, and that is a letter of thanks to you on behalf of the school board, the entire school district, Dr. Cochran and myself, and the entire SAU 106 community. And so we had shirts made, and I, um, all of the school board members have received shirts tonight, and we'll, the rest of the members will also receive them, but so too will all of the SAU 106 staff will each be receiving one of the SAU 106 t-shirts. And lastly, um, in your prize for winning the competition, you will each be receiving a $100 Amazon gift card. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Josh, thank you very much. Great job, guys. Thank you, and hopefully we'll get more student participation on some of the activities that go on in the district. Moving back on the agenda to the distance learning plans for inclement weather. Board members, you received this in executive summary in your packet. Did anybody have any questions on this? We're looking for action for the board to approve this plan, and then it will be um, discussed 
with the uh, respective bargaining units. I know there has been some discussion with them already about this. Are there any questions on this before we looking for an action to approve this as the board's um, this basically allows for snow days and such to, you can continue to have most of the school day, especially for the secondary schools. Uh, allow, uh, yes, allows for synchronous learning. Okay. Yes. So ED, ED 306, 18 uh, was actually amended. It was an emergency rule. ED 306, paragraph 7, um, that we were able to, the emergency rule that went into place allowed for, it replaced the old blizzard bag rule, and it allowed for um, essentially an infinite amount of remote, learning, remote learning was the term used at the time. That has since been replaced with um, a, an amendment to that rule, which includes distance learning days, and ultimately, it's expected that we will need to develop a policy that outlines that, but at this time, we're required to have the school board approve a plan that allows for us to use um, days for distance learning. Okay. Thank you. Steve? Just really quick, do um, all of the students have the ability to distance learn? We do, we've purchased, um, we have the devices and we have since purchased sleeves and adapters that will allow all students to be able to leave with a device, a Chromebook, or if it's a tablet for some of the younger kids. And the plan is that when we suspect that we might have an inclement weather event and uh, we're hopeful that we would be able to potentially use a distance learning day, that we would send the devices home with the students the prior day. Uh, it always depends on power outages and things like that, whether or not we would be able to do that, but in the event that we can have a distance learning day and um, it would be appropriate for our students, that's what we would expect we would do. Go ahead, Steve. What, well, sorry, one more question. Um, uh, as part of this policy, will there be a determination as to when kids will actually have a school day, a uh, snow day, excuse me, or is this any time school, in-person school is canceled, we will refer to this policy? Well, we can use it for up to five days. So only up to five? Yes. Okay, thank you. I think this is a really clear and comprehensive plan, and I commend you guys for putting it together. It's nicely done. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve this distance learning plan? I'll make that. Oh, Go ahead. Sorry. I'll make a motion to approve the distance learning uh, plan. Steve makes a motion. Second? I'll second. Any seconds? All in favor? Five zero. Okay, moving on. The next item on the agenda is the um, Athletics Field Committee. Which I don't see anything on that, but what, what we're really looking at here is uh, on, the, on the Athletic Fields Committee. Oh, oh, it's on the bottom. Yeah. Okay. So, on this item, this, this was brought out before Mr. Fantasia was looking to submit an application for the New Hampshire to the um, Land and Water Conservation Fund grant round to potentially receive funding. Um, we need to approve the uh, superintendent or and or the assistant superintendent of schools to act as applicants to authorize the submission of the grant. So I'm looking for a motion to authorize either the superintendent or assistant superintendent to authorize the grant submission. Yes. Two signers that were needed to be named, 
not in either or. I, I, I don't think so. Is Mr. Fantasia here? No, he's not. But we could, we could substitute uh, superintendent or assistant superintendent uh, or business administrator. Well, why don't, why don't we do this to Maybe the motion should be to uh, uh, certify the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, and the CFO as the applicants of authority for this grant submission. That way, we have three people. We only need two. Steve makes that motion. Is there a second? Uh, Katie seconds. Go ahead, Barbara. Is this related to the land and water conservation update? Yes. I have several questions. Um, so it's a partial, it sounds like it's going to be almost $500,000 for the field. And this is a partial grant. Do we know what percent the grant is going to cover? Yes, it is a uh, reimbursement grant uh, up to 50%. 50%. So we're going to be on the hook for $250,000. Well, the grant itself, uh, Mr. Fantasio, Mr. Inglesby, and I spent uh, a good chunk of Friday in a Zoom meeting with folks from the uh, Parklands and, and Water uh, Conservation Fund. Um, and first, we went through the whole legal aspect. Legally, if we get, legally, if we get the grant, we're committed to establishing, and this is in your uh, uh, memo for board members, to create a public benefit of the entire viable recreational area. Uh, we would need to identify that area, create a long-term plan for the maintenance and care of it, and that this is a commitment that would last into perpetuity. We would be required to maintain it uh, if we ever, for example, if we declared all the area around the high school and middle school as part of this property, then if we, then we, we can't count the schools, so if we actually expanded the schools, we'd have to obtain other land equal in size, either adjacent or elsewhere. So, uh, one, as of 4 o'clock this afternoon, I wrote a very different summary which said we haven't gotten a viable quote. 20 minutes later, we got a viable quote. And so we're able to, to update. But I, I think we need to, uh, first of all, I don't think we can make it for the timeline of, of December 17th and really know what we're doing. Secondly, I think there's a lot of conversations about what is the notion of a viable recreational area? How will it be defined? And does the board want to commit for a perpetual, non-ever-ending commitment to maintain this? And my understanding is if the track is used for the funding, we would have to make sure we always perpetually have a functioning track. And, and so given the unknowns and the amount of, little amount of time we have, uh, what we talked about was moving forward with getting information and getting the grant application ready. I highly doubt we'll be able to have it ready to go and have be comfortable of what we're committing to by December 17th. But there is another window uh, to in the spring to apply and then another uh, window in the next fall. So what we're, we're suggesting that we do is we continue to research this, determine what the, the cost would be, determine what the benefits would be, determine what it is the board would be committing to we expect we would not, as I say, submit it in December 17th, but build up the background of information, give them, the board the information they need to make a decision, hopefully before uh, the, the spring application deadline, and worst case scenario is if we, if we needed to go to default. But it is in some ways a little bit easier for municipalities than SAUs to do this. That was one of the things that came up in the conversation. Uh, but I suspect that there would be an, uh, have to be an awful lot of conversations with both community members, you know, community rec, that sort of thing, to make sure that this is aligned and supported as something that we continue to do. So for now, we'll just, can just do that. We'll work on this moving forward. Highly, highly unlikely that we'll make the deadline on December 17th, but we'll continue to work on it, see if it's viable, see if it's something we want to invest in, and if it is, we'll continue to push forward. Okay, I have a couple more questions. Um, if we do make it for the public benefit, does that mean we have to open up the school grounds to the public on um, some sort of basis? Only if it's part of the perpetual, sorry, of the uh, viable recreational area. It's a very specific definition that you would have to, to claim. Um, so how do we make sure our schools get the time we need on those facilities? Right. That's, that's part of the question. 
You know, what, is, what is the commitment and what happens when a, a school grounds overlays with this perpetual equipment? It sounded uh, on the basis of it that during, there's nothing that would stop us from saying during school hours, you know, the property is used for school and outside of school hours, but we haven't con had that confirmed in writing yet. So that's one of the, the things that, that we want to and clarify. And one sure. that really concerns me is if, if we do expand the school and, you know, do extra parking lots or whatever, that we have to put aside the same amount of land somewhere else. And Plasto already has given all this land, has, has made this land available. Is that going to be in Plasto or is that going to be in another town? I mean, because I don't want to put an unfair burden on Plasto. Since the entity in the grant application is the SAU, um, I'm presuming that it would have to be in Plasto. Yeah, well, I, 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 I want to just raise that objection right now, but I, I, I don't think that would be fair. Um, so I, I, I'm not in favor of this. I, I'm okay with heading for the spring of 2022 and getting the um, getting our ducks in a row and seeing if, yeah. if we can get some... We recognize that we still have a lot of questions. We still have a lot of questions. Um, and that, that uh, what, was, what was put here really reflected that. There may be a good opportunity here. It may not be a good match for us. Mm -hmm. But we'll do our due diligence. We'll bring forward the information as we're able to get it out. And then we'll bring it forward to the board for the consideration. Um, but I think it'll be something that, that will need, as I say, a lot of community input. So I think we're looking more likely next fall than in the spring. Okay. Yeah, yeah but certainly not for December. I don't want to see this happen in December. That it would be too quick. Yeah, perpetuities all yeah. So, yeah. We had, there's a motion on the floor and there's a second. All that it does is authorize the signers of the grant. I don't have any problem with that. Also, if you did somehow make application by December 17th, it doesn't commit you. If, if you got the grant, you'd still have to accept the grant funding. I'm not saying that we would do that. I don't think you're going to make that application, but just because you, you apply for a grant, you don't have to accept it, especially if with these caveats. Anyway, so there's a motion and a second on the floor. Any other questions before we vote that motion? All in favor? One, two, three, Amy, four. Opposed? One, four, one. Motion carries. Moving on, the next item on the agenda is substitute teacher stipends. Um, in your packets, you'll see that the current substitute rates and the proposed substitute uh, rates, we have found that we're not really competitive in the market around uh, this area. And so we're looking to move these rates up. Does anybody have any questions or? Did we want to have Director O'Gara speak to that? Because the parts at the bottom of the, of the extra, I think we were concerned that we were significantly lower than surrounding districts, and we may be on base pay. But the ability to get a $25 bonus after every five days of substituting makes it more competitive for us, Director O'Gara? But, but it's not after every five days of substituting. It is not after every five days of substituting. After five days of substituting, you get a $25 bonus. Are you telling me you get it once every five days? No. Five-day bonus for every five days of substituting. Okay. Um, so raising these rates here, they get more. Because instead of getting, you know, every $20. We raise the rates by $15 and $20. So they're getting more. We only have right now 
um, between September and October, we only have 42 subs working, and they're working to fill uh, 462 vacancies in two months. And pre-pandemic, we had 67 subs working um, to, to fill 586. One, one of the issues with this model is that it's actually pretty labor intensive. We could have somebody who substitutes at three or four different buildings, and people have to fill the paperwork and send it over, and then it goes to the payroll. Right. And it goes. So one of the questions becomes, this is what we have. Should we go to something that's just a higher base pay? This would be easier to administer, and it would be more um, compelling for people to come and sub for us. Yeah, I, I don't have any issue with this, and I know other districts are still higher than this. Yes. Close districts that are close to us. Yeah. Yeah, we certainly have budget and substitute lines. I don't think it's going to require that we're going to have to move money into that. Maria, do you think we're going to have to make a budget transfer? This is not huge amounts of money. Our budget right now has three hundred and twenty thousand dollars for so for substitute teachers. Uh, that equals at one hundred and thirty dollars per day. Equals to fifty-eight sub days. That's it. That's what we have in the budget. So most likely, yes, if the rate goes up, we will at some point we will have to request a transfer. Just so you are aware. <clears throat> well, because the sub budget is 320000 so if we raise the rate of $130 a day, that equals, to do the math, it costs 15 days. So that's what we have. So, approximately, how much do you think this is going to run this over budget based on the average number of subs that we're running a day? And now you're up in the rate by about 20. I, that, I think that's a question for Dana, if she can give us the average of how many software we're using a day. But how many subs a day are we averaging in district? How many subs a day we're averaging in the district? Right, yeah, but how many are we using every day? Like, how many subs are active every day? Okay, so every, every day when I, if I'm the superintendent and I come in, there are 42 substitute teachers in district working. But how many subs work on a day? Can, can, can I look into this data and get back to you guys? Please? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't have the answer. I, I think that we, we need to move with this because we are in a situation. I don't think this is a huge... Right. I, I understand what you're... I understand. I don't think this is huge amounts of money based on how many subs. So let, let, let me ask it in a different way. We have, what, 450-some-odd employees, is that what you said? About approximately how many are out per day? Can, can we please look into the data? We'll look into this somewhere. somewhere. But I, I'm for approving this, and then we can see the ramifications. I don't think this is, can't be a lot of money. Steve? <clears throat> Maria, can, uh, while you're looking into that, could you also look at um, the number of substitutes that we have and the length of stay in one particular time? So 
are substituting more than five days at a time. Is there a report that you guys could? Okay. I'd, I'd like to see that data as well. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody want to make a motion on this to approve this new rate? That we approve the new rate as top manager. Is there a second? Katie seconds. Any other questions? All in favor? Five zero. Thank you. Okay. Um, administrator's report, Dr. Cochran. Uh, nothing in terms of administrative report in that sense. Uh, we do have a personnel report. Okay. Nomination of Jenny Blanchett uh, as a math interventionist at Tumberlane uh, uh, Regional Middle School. Screening committee was Principal Winces and uh, Sandy Allaire. Uh, one qualified applicant and brought forward this evening for nomination. Seat. I will right. nominate Jamie Blanchett for math interventions. Is there a second? D seconds. seconds. All in favor? Five zero. So that's why you've been making all the motions tonight, huh, Barbara? Yeah. It's, it's that seat. It's the seat. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, next item on the agenda is um, committee reports. Um, Amy, do you have anything? Uh, we met as a curriculum committee. We're hoping to have um, Mark Henderson and Kelly Brooks attend an upcoming meeting um, to put forward some new curriculum in math, health, special education, and elementary tech. Um, do you want all of the curriculum at once, or would the board prefer it to be kind of spent over time, or give it over time? Well, it really kind of depends on what's on the agenda for that particular evening. Yep. I mean, when it's ready to come to the board, just let the superintendent know, and when we meet to discuss what's going to be on the agenda, then we can decide how much of it we can put. You know, and we can put it all on the agenda and just bump it out if we find the meeting is too long. Okay. So, the, the, I mean, the sooner it gets in place, the better. Okay. We are hoping to have it ready to go for the next meeting. Okay. Um, Ms. Brooks and um, Mr. Pedersen speak to some of these because some of them are fairly um, involved. Uh, on the are, are you on the curriculum? curriculum? Yes, I am. Oh, okay. I'm on. That's fine. Um, if there are specifics that you want discussed, if not, I mean, the board members will have the curriculum packets before they reach us to ask questions. I think with special education in particular, there could be some specifics that it would be good to have Kelly here for. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Uh, we'll discuss it when we get ready to present it. Okay. Uh, Steve? Uh, yes. So the policy committee met uh, last week. We have uh, three policies coming to the board for first read next meeting. Okay. Um, there are also a couple of other policies that we're doing a little more um, work on uh, that I, I would suspect that we will uh, have to the board soon. Um, we are talking potentially about adding um, an additional meeting uh, for the policy committee to meet um, just to kind of move forward some of these policies that um, you know we need to move forward. So uh, more to come. Okay. Thank you. Barbara? No, that's better. Okay. okay. Katie? Okay. Um, union negotiations continue. Um, we are TTAs in negotiations, um, and myself, Steve, and Brian are negotiating with the other three other bargaining units right now. So we'll continue to do that and update the board. Is there anything else that anybody wants? We do need to move into non-public sessions. I'm looking to move into a non-public session under 91A, colon 3, paragraph 2A. Um, 
and hang on, I just have to read which one this is. What do we need to see? Yeah, it's going to be A, C. AC and I. Steve makes a motion. Barbara seconds. Kathy, did you do a roll call on that? Yes. Okay, thank you. I don't anticipate we'll be making any public uh, actions, so this will end our recording for the evening.